lions of Tarshish in Ezekiel 38, or that we are uh, that great city Babylon in Revelation 17 and 18, or some people even say we're the, we're the ten lost tribes of Israel. There's all kinds of views out there about that. But I don't think America is mentioned in any of those places. You say, well, what's the significance of that? Well, I think that means something dramatic is going to happen to America. Because I think as great of a power as we are, if we were the dominant force in the world during that time, I think God would mention us. I mean, he mentions Russia, or Rosh. He mentions the, the kings of the east. I think he would mention America if we were that great power in the end times. So I think something must happen to America. Now you say, well, what's going to happen? Well, we don't know because the Bible doesn't say. But we can use sanctified speculation, I think, about that. I mean, it could be uh, some type of a nuclear 9-11 God forbid that would ever happen here, but it could. I mean, it could be economic. Um, the, the debt in our country is crushing our nation. There was an article in uh, Newsweek a year ago that I read. It really, really woke me up. It, it had a picture on the front of it of the U.S. Capitol turned upside down. And the title of the, of the cover, in fact, it was, on, uh, it was last December 7th, if you want to look it up from a year ago in Newsweek. And the cover said, How Empires Die. And the main thing it had in there is the main thing that's caused, they went back and looked at empires from history. The main thing that causes them to fall is debt, massive crushing debt. They went back and looked at some great empires. Their debt got so great that to pay their debt it caused them to, to not be able to keep their military what it needed to be. And their military began to crumble because they were in such massive debt and eventually they were overrun and overtaken by other nations. I think that's instructive because you look at the, the, the uh, difficulty in our nation of the economic disaster and, you know, the, the China and other nations coming and buying up all of our bonds and buying up key financial uh, U.S. institutions. Think about the, the dependency we have on oil. I mean, think about how bad our economy is now. If oil, you know, if gas went to, you know, $5, $8, $10 a gallon because of some catastrophe over um, in the Middle East. No one knows for sure, but these are all scenarios that could take place. There's a quote, some of you probably heard this from Alexander Teitler. He said this, he said, the average age of the world's greatest civilizations from the beginning of history has been about 200 years. During those 200 years, these nations always progress through the following sequence. From bondage to spiritual faith, from spiritual faith to great courage, from courage to liberty, from liberty to abundance, from abundance to complacency, from complacency to apathy, from apathy to dependence, and from dependence back into bondage. Now, I'll let you figure out where we are on that scale, but we're certainly in the latter half of it. Many people believe our country is going to fall from within. Uh, years ago, back in 1857, listen to what this British uh, parliamentarian said. This is 160 years ago. He said, your republic, talking about America, will be as fearfully plundered and laid waste by barbarians in the 20th century as the Roman Empire was in the 5th century. With this difference, the, Han, the, the Huns and the Vandals who ravaged the Roman Empire came from without, and your Huns and Vandals will have been engendered within your own country. It's a pretty prophetic word from 160 years ago. Look over in your Bible in Romans chapter 1. Romans chapter 1. This is a, a very sobering chapter to look at in light of, of our nation, or really any nation. Romans chapter 1 and verse 18 talks about God's wrath. There, there are three different aspects to the wrath of God in the Bible. There's what we might call God's direct wrath. You know, that's like Sodom and Gomorrah or the flood. You know, when God directly comes and brings his wrath to the earth. There's another kind of wrath we often call eschatological wrath, or the day of the Lord wrath, that God's going to pour out in the future during the tribulation. But there's a third kind of wrath we don't think about very often, and that we could call that the wrath of abandonment. It's an indirect kind of wrath, where God pours out his wrath by basically turning people over to their own sin. Look at chapter 1 and verse 18 of Romans. It says, For the wrath of God is revealed. It doesn't say will be revealed. It is being revealed against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who suppress the truth and unrighteousness. And he goes on down in verses 24 to 30, 
to 24 to 32, and three times, and you see it in verse 24, and in verse 26, and in verse 28, where three times it says, God gave them over. God gave them over. God gave them up. That's the wrath of God that's being spoken of here. It's the wrath of God abandoning people to their own sinful ways. And literally to give them over to it means more than just God taking his hands off. It actually means God gives you a push in that direction if that's where you want to go. Now let me read verse 24. It says, Therefore God gave them over in the lusts of their hearts to impurity so that their bodies would be dishonored among them. For they exchanged the truth of God for a lie, literally the lie. And they worshiped and served the creature rather than the creator who is blessed forever. What this is saying is God gave people over to impurity, the lusts of their bodies. What is that talking about? A sexual revolution. That's what happened in our country in the 60s and on into the 70s. Look at verse 26. For this reason God gave them over to degrading passions. For their women exchanged a natural function for that which is unnatural. And in the same way, the men abandoned the natural function of the woman and burned in their desire toward one another. Men with men committing indecent acts and receiving in their own persons the due penalty of their error. What would we call that? It's a homosexual revolution. It started here in the 1980s in our country and still going unabated today. I've lived in my lifetime. I was born in 1959, and so in my lifetime, I've seen firsthand the, the, the sexual revolution in our country and the homosexual revolution. And then in verses 28 to 32, it says God gave them over, and basically it's just the open encouragement of evil. Now here's the rub in this passage. What this passage is saying, it's not saying when this stuff starts to happen, God will judge you. What it's saying is when you see this stuff happening, it's a sign God already is judging you. He's turning you over to your own sin as a culture. Now, that's a sobering thing to think about because people always ask me, well, when's God going to judge America? And what's the answer? He already is. He's turning us over to our own a sinfulness. Now, the question is, do we just give up then, throw in the towel, say, well, man, things are going downhill. You know, it's all over with. Well, I don't know God's mind. God may rescue our nation if we turn to him. But it starts with each one of us individually. You know, I can sit around and talk about how bad the culture is out there, but if I'm living an ungodly life and living a life of immorality, if I'm hooked on pornography and, and it's a $14 billion a year industry, if I'm involved in all this sexual sin in our country, well, how can I say, boy, our country sure is going downhill if I'm doing those things myself? We need to get our own act together and turn to the Lord. That's all we can do. The only person I can control what they do is myself. If we will do what God wants us to do. And the other thing I think as a nation is we need to support Israel. I think as bad as our nation is, one of the reasons God has blessed America is our support for Israel. God said in Genesis chapter 12 to Abraham, those who bless you all bless, but the one who curses you I must curse. And America, as bad as we've been in a lot of areas, overall we get a good report card on our treatment of the nation of Israel. And I'm concerned about that now and the way and the direction we're headed right now and now. So it's one of the things that we need to, to focus on. Here's my thesis, though, that I'll give to you. I think America will probably remain, a, a, hopefully, a strong nation until the rapture comes. I think God's judgment on America is going to be the rapture. If you look at the statistics, about 10% of the people in America, if you ask them, answer correctly of how you get to heaven. That is that you get there through God's grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. But think about if that number's correct. That's 30 million people gone in the moment in the twinkling of an eye, the salt and the light out of this country. Now there's believers all over this world, but over in the Middle East it's, you know, point something percent. In Europe it's less than one percent now of, of true um, evangelical believers. So I think America would be devastated. You talk about a drop on the Dow Jones the next day. You talk about unpaid mortgages, you know, a mortgage crisis. Think about 30 million people, the salt and the light of this country, disappearing in a moment of time. I think it'll devastate this country. I think America will go from a leading nation to a following nation, probably become part of the empire of the Antichrist, looking for some uh, place uh, to find refuge. I saw a church sign recently down in Denton, Texas, and the church sign said, the rapture, the separation of church and state. 
And uh, I like that because that's when it's going to happen someday. God's going to make the separation when it, when it happens. But I think America is going to decline. That's the only way that I see we can explain how these other nations are going to rise. Because in, in Revelation 13, verse 4, it says about during the tribulation, it says, who is like the beast or the Antichrist? Who can make war with him? In other words, he's going to be running the world. Well, if he's running the world, that means America is not running the world unless we're somehow in league with him or, 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 or confederate with him. So I think America is going to be brought to her knees, and I think it will probably take place at the rapture when that event takes place. So that's another signpost out there I think that we see. Now let me mention a fifth one of these signposts on the road to Armageddon, and that is a peace treaty. You remember one of the great features of the ancient Roman Empire was called the Pax Romana, or the Roman Peace. You know, they built roads everywhere, and there was stability overall in the world, which allowed cultures to flourish. Well, the Bible says that the event that starts the coming tribulation period is what I call the new Pax Romana, the new Roman peace. Is this Antichrist is going to come and make a treaty with the nation of Israel. This is one of the key events of the tribulation. Remember in Daniel 9.27, it says that he, that is the Antichrist, will make a firm covenant with the many in Israel for a period of seven years. And that idea of a firm covenant can even have the idea of a forced covenant. That he's going to force this upon uh, the nations there. We'll look a little bit later at Ezekiel 38, but it says in, when these nations invade Israel in Ezekiel 38, they're going to be at rest, living securely. They're going to be at peace. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, it says this. Paul says, you don't have any need for anyone to write uh, to you about the times or the seasons. For you know full well the day of the Lord will come like a thief in the night. For while they are saying peace and safety, sudden destruction will come upon them suddenly like birth pangs upon a woman, and they will by no means escape. There's going to be a time of peace and safety as people are crying out and yearning for it. Then all the way over in Revelation 6, as the very beginning of the tribulation takes place and the seals are open, the first seal is a rider on a white horse. He's a false messiah. Because Jesus, remember, comes on a white horse in chapter 19 at the end. This is at the beginning, a man coming on a white horse. And the rider on the next horse, it says, there's a rider on a red horse who takes peace from the earth. So he can only take peace if there is peace. So that means this rider on the white horse must bring some kind of peace to the earth. So we see in Daniel 9, Ezekiel 38, 1 Thessalonians, Revelation, all of these speak of this idea of a peace at the beginning of the tribulation. What does the world want more desperately than anything today? Peace. Peace in the Middle East. With Hamas and Israel and Hezbollah and Iran over there, I mean, it, it looks like things could boil over and threaten to bring the whole world into it at any time. So the world yearns for peace. And after the rapture, these ten kings arise, these ten horns, but a little horn comes up among them, that little horn of Daniel 7, and he's the one who's going to come and make that peace treaty. Now, people are always trying to figure out who the Antichrist is. And I always tell people, if you ever do figure out who he is, I've got bad news for you. You've been left behind. Because you're not going to figure out who he is till after the rapture. Because you see the restrainer has to be removed for Satan to have the power and authority to bring his man on the scene. And I take the restrainer there is the restraining influence of the Holy Spirit through the church. Here's an interesting thing to think about. Satan doesn't know when God is going to bring the events of the end times to pass. So I believe Satan has a man ready in every generation. There's always an antichrist out there. Satan always has somebody ready. But one of these days when the Lord removes the restraining influence, uh, takes the church out of here through the Spirit, then Satan's going to be able to bring his man on the scene, the Antichrist. And people always wonder about who he is. One of the big questions is, could he be an American? Could he be a particular American? Sometimes people want to know. American president. Um, I don't think the Antichrist will be an American. Because in Daniel 9.26... It says that the people of the prince who is to come will destroy the city of Jerusalem. Well, who destroyed Jerusalem? The, the Romans did. And it says those are the people of this coming prince. Now, I don't think that means necessarily that he'll be an Italian. 
but he'll be from the old Roman Empire somewhere. Now some will say, well, but America, we're an extension of the Roman 